ahead, Deb. Nope. Oh, do you do you want me to start or? Yes, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> wasn't sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for um, joining us today. We're going, we have Stephanie Will, and she's going to present Managing Stress in an Unmanageable Time. I suppose I should tell you who I am. Um, I'm Debbie Dorsey. I am Assistant Professor of Health at Harvard Community College, and I am going to be the moderator today. So uh, just a few reminders, if you would, make sure that you keep your, I think everyone has, keep your uh, mic off for us and also, um, or mute it rather. Um, and as we go through, if you have questions, but you sort of feel like, okay, we can wait till the end of the presentation, you know, to, for me to, you know, ask my question, go ahead and type that into the chat. But if you have a burning question and you need to have the answer now, it's also okay to uh, use the hand raise function, which uh, if you are familiar with Zoom, of course, or if you're not, is down at the bottom in reactions. When you click on that, you should be able to see the raise your hand function. So uh, a little bit about Stephanie. She is a licensed clinical professional counselor who works at Montgomery College um, as the mental health services program manager with the Student Health and Wellness Shawl Center for Success. Um, and she provides mental health education and programming to students, faculty, and staff, including weekly mindful weekly mindfulness meditation at the Mental Health First Aid certification. Oh, and the Mental Health First Aid uh, certification. So without further ado, I will uh, turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Debbie. I truly appreciate the introduction. Um, I am going to go ahead and ask if I can share my screen. Okay, pull up my slides. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about managing stress in an unmanageable time. Um, so, for the, those of you uh, who are here with us today, who has felt maybe a little bit overwhelmed in the last two years? I was gonna say, I, using some of those emojis, <laughs> potentially <laughs> seeing a couple raised hands, you know, um, I, you know, I've been working in the college setting, in my personal life, um, I don't know if I've talked to anyone who hasn't been at least a little bit overwhelmed uh, in the last couple of years with COVID. This has certainly been, um, you know, everyone's favorite word has been unprecedented. And I'm sorry, I am going to take my mask off. I'm in my office, but the door is closed and my office mate is gone for now. So I can breathe a little bit. Um, so yeah, even things like that, having to wear masks when we're trying to teach or talk, um, everything that we've done has been very um, different than maybe it was in the past. Um, we've had to learn to navigate in a very different and very changed um, space. And it's been challenging unbelievably challenging uh, for people over the last couple of years. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about um, how people have been reacting to those challenges. Um, you know, do we see an end in sight at this point? And what are some of the things that we can do to help manage this stress as much as we possibly can um, when we are sometimes so stressed out that functioning is, frankly, kind of challenging. So that's what we're going to be talking a little bit about as we go through today. So obviously, we know, in addition to all of the normal life stressors that we have, you know, school, family, work, um, you know, finances, you know, just all of those things that normally we would have to do and, you know, get through for our day to day and um, those big bumps in the road that we would have to deal with. When we layered the pandemic on top of it, it made everything a lot harder to deal with. 
Um, the big things that we've seen have been an increase in anxiety, fear, depression, anger. Um, you know, it's not just necessarily the, these um, fearful emotions, people um, feeling like they want to lash out at others, irritability. Um, that's very much come along as a result of the added stress of the pandemic. There's been so much uncertainty. Um, first, it was around people worrying about losing their jobs, and now there don't seem to be enough workers, the great resignation that's going on, leaving so many of us um, in places that are understaffed and we need help. Um, you know, there's a lot of question about health. Is it safe to go back into uh, spaces? Um, you know, maybe I don't have any health concerns, but maybe I live with somebody who um, has a, a pre-existing condition that would make them more susceptible to COVID. Um, some of us haven't, I, I know it has never happened to me before, but I think I've made it almost two years without getting a cold and that's felt kind of great and wonderful. And now I almost have this fear of getting normal sick because I'm like, I, it, it's so terrible and it's awful. And I, I really enjoyed not being sick at all. So there's just still so much uncertainty about things um, and things are still changing quickly. Um, by the time it feels like a press release can go out saying this is what the new rules are, all of a sudden things change overnight again. I know over in Montgomery County at the very beginning of Omicron, they had just, you know, gotten rid of some of the mask mandates. And then within less than 24 hours, it was like, just kidding. We're back over the numbers that we need to be. So, so it's almost like whiplash sometime when you're trying to figure out what's going on, what are the rules, um, what is okay uh, for us to be able to do. And we know that when we're dealing with all of this, this is impacting people's sleep. And once we're not sleeping, that leads to a whole host of other issues. Um, you know, pay, being able to pay attention, being able to focus, concentrate, motivation, physical um, issues that can come up when we're not sleeping. Motivation has been a major one that I've seen professionally um, throughout the pandemic. People who want to do things, um, but they just can't actually get themselves going, can't get themselves moving. Um, there was a term that it is a very old term, but I had only just recently discovered it during the pandemic, um, something called languishing, where we're, somebody's not necessarily mentally ill, but we're not mentally well. So just like our physical illness is on a spectrum, our mental wellness is on a spectrum as well. So a lot of people were experiencing this languishing where they didn't necessarily have depression or an anxiety disorder, but they definitely weren't feeling well and they were experiencing a lot of these types of symptoms, but it wasn't to this point where, oh, I now have a diagnosable mental illness. We all know that Zoom fatigue is very real. Um, there are 12 of us on here today and I remember the first um, MOL uh, presentation that I did, I think there were like 40 or 50 people on here. Um, we spend a lot of time on screens and that also impacts our ability to focus and concentrate and retain information um, when we're not getting a certain amount of novelty. Um, there's been a lot of obviously isolation. Uh, some people have compensated, decompensated into their mental health disorders, people who have dealt with depression and anxiety um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, that isolation can be really damaging and dangerous for people. Um, even those of us who are introverts and are like, oh my gosh, all I ever want to do is sit and read a book or, you know, watch Netflix. Even we need that social interaction. So there is that still that fine line between isolation and, um, getting that introvert time that we need. And there's also been so much extra time spent um, not just on social media, but on devices in general, um, you know, spending a lot of time watching news, reading the news, um, looking at what other people are doing or not doing. And especially if we're in either a place where we're feeling mentally ill or we're languishing, watching some other people who may be feeling more comfortable going out and about or 
maybe are disregarding some of the rules. It can lead to a lot of comparisons. It can lead to a lot of negativity. Um, and it can lead to a lot of negative feeling. Even if people are doing things that we agree with, um, even if people are talking about things that we're like, yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, totally get what you're saying. Um, these things end up kind of stacking up and weighing on us in a way that we don't always realize they do, especially when we're spending a lot of time scrolling through our social media pages. So there's been a lot of factors going on. <laughs> but we're kind of at this point now where we're looking at what's next. Um, I think Omicron took everybody a little bit by surprise with how serious everything was. You know, we had the vaccine, um, you know, people were starting to get boosted, things were feeling good, things were feeling we were opening back up, and then Omicron hit. And now the numbers are going back down again. And people keep talking about, you know, oh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, they're talking about vaccines for young children, you know, that six months to five years old age, like, this is the end, right? We're, we're at the end of this, things are going to go back to normal. But if we really sit and think and look at what life looks like, are we already pretty much back to some semblance of normal? You know, are we really still social distancing? Um, you know, we might have to wear masks when we're at work, uh, but, you know, are we masking when we are out at the movie theater? Are we masking when we're spending time with our friends or our family in a personal space at a restaurant? Um, how is the end really going to look different at this point? And for some people, this is really starting to weigh on them. Like, are things really going to be that much different when we are in a post COVID-19 world, when this has become officially endemic and this is just part of life and something that we, um, we just deal with on a day to day and it's not considered a pandemic anymore. You know, we talk so much about the additional stress and anxiety that COVID has caused, but is it magically gonna go away? Um, what has been, what is going to be the permanent impact of something like this. Um, and that's, these are questions that we don't know the answer to. Um, I think a lot of people like to think that this is gonna be like a magic wand that, yay, COVID is gone. It's all wonderful and great and everything goes back to the way it was and we can just continue our lives. But without a way to resolve and frankly accept what has gone on and the reality of the situation there is no going back to normal things have changed so significantly in so many different ways not just because of covid not just because of the pandemic just because life marches on over years right um you know we can't go back to 2018 just like we can't go back to you know 1962 or you know pick a year there is no going back. Things are different. Things are changed. And we are changed. We are different than we were two years ago. Um, and that might be heavily impacted by the pandemic, but we still would have been different people today than we were two years ago anyway. So the realist in me is is really starting to prepare myself for this isn't going to be a magic fix when COVID is over because it is a different world and we have to deal with the reality of what this world is now. Now, I apologize if everybody is like, I did not sign on to be bummed out or um, depressed by this realist lady uh, first thing in the morning. And I appreciate you sticking with me because we are going to talk about some ways for us to really think about this stress and help to relieve and manage some of this stress. Because again, there is no magic wand. There is nothing that's just going to magically make things better for us as much as we wish there was. Because everybody experiences stress, right? Stress is a universal, it is something that ties every single person in this world together. Um, I have yet to meet a person who has never been stressed out about anything in their life. 
maybe you know a person like this and I would love to know what their secret is. But I, you know, I do, I have not met that person yet. I do not know what that secret is. So it's all about being able to manage the stress that is in front of us. Um, we tend to think of stress as a bad thing. And when we talk about distress, we are talking about something that we want to be able to resolve. Um, when we're talking about distress, we're talking about a frequent and intense strain on our body. This is causing, you know, physical problems, mental health problems. Um, it's causing us to be exhausted, to be able to, or to not, to not be able to function when we're working. But there is such a thing as good stress, this you stress. And this is actually things that can help us focus and get the task at hand done. So when we talk about stress, I don't wanna just unilaterally draw a line through stress and say it's all bad. We want some you stress in our life. Um, it helps to motivate us. Uh, a you stress event is the thing that we go into knowing that it's going to be hard, knowing that it's going to be challenging, but also believing that it is within our realm of coping. I have the skills that I need to deal with this stressful event. You stress events are short term. It's not something that we enter into um, knowing that, hey, there's not an end date on this and I'm just going to have to deal with it for as long as I have to deal with it. Um, and you stress events can feel exciting. Um, it could be buying a new house, welcoming a new member into your family, you know, whether through your birth, adoption, marriage, um, having a new puppy or a new kitten and, and having to worry about training that animal. It's a good thing, but it's still something that's going to be hard. It's still something that's going to be challenging for us. Starting a master's program, a PhD program, or even just taking a class that you know is going to be challenging. I decided to take ASL um, a little while ago and I knew that was going to be hard languages are not my thing but I really enjoyed it and I enjoyed that learning even though it took a lot of work and it took a lot of um a lot of brain power from me so these you stress events are really growth oriented um they can help improve our feelings of contentment feeling like I was able to achieve something it can help inspire us um make us motivated it can help us psychologically building that autonomy, that belief that I can do things, that, that I have the skills needed to do whatever it is I want to do. During the pandemic, I wrote a draft of a novel for the first time, and that's something that I wanted to do for pretty much the entirety of my life. And it's terrible, but that's okay, because I know I can do it now. I can write that first draft. So these are the kind of growth opportunities we get from you stress. Um, and even physically, we can have you stress events, like going to the gym, going through like a, like a, one of those like boot camp workouts or like a hot yoga class or something where it's challenging and, you know, maybe you hate it while you're doing it and maybe it's tough while you're doing it. But when you're done with a you stress event, those are the, those are the events and the things that you get done with it and you feel like, ah, oh, this was awesome. I achieved something. It was hard, but I'm a better person for coming out the other side of it. Whereas when we talk about distress, those are the events that when we get through to the end of it, it's, I'm exhausted. I can't function. Um, I'm getting sick. Uh, I remember back when I was in college, I would get through finals every semester. I would get home and be like, yes, I'm finally done. And then I would immediately be sick with the flu for two weeks. It didn't matter if it was spring semester or fall semester, I would always get sick. So the reason I like to talk about both sides of stress is because we need that good stress, right? We don't want to eliminate anything that's stressful from our life. But at the same time, with the pandemic, with everything that's been added, some of what might have been a use stress event for us in the past when you add all these other things on top of it, it can make that more challenging for us. So, you know, when we talk about managing stress, we'll talk a little bit about picking, picking and choosing the things that we decide to take on as a way to manage stress. One of the things that I want you all to do is to take a look at this list of symptoms of distress. And you don't have to share them or anything. You know, this is very, you know, personal. 
but taking a look at what are the things that you notice within yourself that tell you, hey, I'm feeling stressed. For me, I tend to feel irritability. I know I'm stressed when I start getting snippy with people um, or I feel like I'm getting short with them. I also find that if I'm doing like a meditation and my teeth are clenched together or like my tongue is like locked to the roof of my mouth, I know I'm really stressed at that point. And the reason I want everyone to kind of think about what are your symptoms of stress is because if we know these, if we're checking in with ourselves, and we're seeing, oh, okay, you know, I didn't sleep that well last night or the night before, is something going on? Rather than waiting to this point where we're so stressed that we can't function, we want to notice these stress symptoms early so we can intervene early. Because again, just like with all things, uh, you know, like if you break your leg and don't go to the doctor for three months about it and it's started to heal and your leg is crooked and you can't walk, it's going to take a lot more to fix that than if you broke your leg and immediately went to the doctor, right? It's the same thing with our mental health. The sooner that we start doing self-care, the sooner that we see a counselor or take medication, whatever it is that you potentially need, there is a variety of different options that each person has, um, the better chance of a positive recovery um, and a more complete recovery that we will have if we intervene early. So knowing these signs is really important for that reason. There's a few other things that help um, to keep in mind when we are experiencing stress that impact how we experience the stress. Um, the first one that I think is particularly important right now is looking at the locus of control. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with locus of control, this is basically, do I feel like my actions have an impact on outcomes or do I feel like I'm being acted on by outside forces and things that I do don't matter? And now we know that obviously both are always true, right? Uh, there, we can't control the weather. Uh, we can't control some of the political factors going on. What we can control is, do I bring an umbrella? What I can't control is, do I vote? Um, so we know that there are, are both sides of it. But there are some individuals who tend more towards one or the other. They feel like they're in control of a lot more factors that are going on or people who feel like I really am being acted upon by outside forces. And there's almost this learned helplessness. Like, why should I even try? Why should I bother? Because it doesn't matter what I do, these things are just gonna keep happening. Um, and what we want is we want that more internal locus of control. The more that we feel like our actions can positively or negatively impact a situation, the less that stress is going to impact us. Because if we always feel like there's nothing I can do, it's gonna feel a lot more stressful, right? So if you think about a situation in your own life that's maybe gone on, whether it's a relationship or a class, um, I'll, you know, I'll use the example of a class where you know we work really hard on every single assignment, we're studying and our teacher just keeps knocking points off. Um, we don't feel like we're being graded fairly. We're gonna stop trying in that class, right? It's like, well, the teacher doesn't like me. It doesn't matter how much I study or how much effort I put into this. If the teacher doesn't like me, I'm not gonna do well. So I'm gonna stop trying. Um, whereas on the other side, again, someone who's experiencing that internal locus of control might feel like, okay, maybe this teacher doesn't like me. What are some of the other things that I can do? Can I maybe find a different um, professor for this class? Is there um, a tutoring service that I could maybe go to? Are there other things that I can do? Um, 
So the more that we focus on that internal locus of control, the more that we are able to see that stress for what it is. Um, so being able to um, look at things that way can be helpful in how we experience our stress. Another thing that impacts how we experience our stress is our self-talk. Um, you know, we all have that voice in our head. Um, you know, I, I, I have a hour long commute, so I constantly talk to myself <laughs> in my head. I'm always having a conversation with me about, you know, what, what needs to get done or, you know, what's gone on over the course of the day. And that self-talk in my head can either really ramp me up or it can make me feel really bad, right? So when something negative happens, when a stressful event happens, what is the self-talk that's going on in our heads? What am I saying to myself about this experience? Am I saying things like, it's okay, everyone fails, we can get through this, we'll try this, we'll do better next time? Or are we saying to ourselves that we're worthless, that uh, we can't do it, that you know, you've tried and you should just give up. So again, being able to notice your self-talk and change our self-talk, because we can do that, we can change what we say to ourselves about an experience, um, can again impact that locus of control, can impact those experiences of stress. If we're able to speak more positively about that experience, even if the experience didn't go the way we wanted it to go. And that really falls into self-compassion as well. How do I see my shortcomings and how do I see my failures? Because again, not to be, you know, the Debbie Downer or anything, we are all going to fail at things in life. We are all going to struggle. None of us is perfect. That is something that ties everyone together in the human experience that we are not perfect um, and that things are not gonna go right for us all of the time. So by employing self-compassion, it's about understanding that that's part of life, that it isn't a personal failing on our own part that, oh, well, you're just not good enough. We're all gonna fail at some point. We're all gonna get fired from a job or fail a class or not get elected to a position or not make a team or have a, you know, a relationship break up or get divorced. These are things that are going to happen at some point to each person. So really looking at the way that we see these failures, how are we taking these failures in? Do we take them in as that growth experience, that learning experience, or are we taking them in as something that we see that makes us less than or not good enough? So all of these things, when we have a stressful event going on, um, you know, not talking about necessarily the pandemic as a whole, but whatever the other normal everyday stressful thing that we have going on, it's really important that we're taking a look at these events from all sides. What are the messages that we're receiving internally about these stressful events? Because that's all going to impact how it is going to affect our body and our minds. So I mentioned before, when we talk about stress management and use stress, um, is that being able to pick and choose what we do with our time, even when it's a positive stress event, because if we take on 12 positive stress events at the same time, we're probably, it's probably gonna turn into distress, right? We're probably gonna get overwhelmed at some point. And one of the great things that I think the pandemic actually taught us was that there's always going to be things that we do not expect happening, right? Um, one of the things that I talk to our students at MC about all the time now is making sure we really look at our schedule and not scheduling ourselves to 100% of our capacity. Because I think a lot of people going into, you know, spring of 2020, rightfully so, we were just continuing on with our lives. We were like, this is the amount of time I have in a day. How do I make the most of it? How do I get to do all the things that I 
want to do and are going to help me with my career and, you know, help me do well in school. <clears throat> and we scheduled ourselves to probably very close to 100% of our capacity. And then COVID happened and dropped a gigantic bomb in the middle of everything, right? And because we were already scheduled to our capacity, adding that additional stressful event on top of it already put us in a place where I can no longer cope. And it doesn't have to be COVID. COVID's kind of an extreme example, but it can be the death of a loved one. It can be a divorce. It can be a car accident. Now I have a major financial or medical issue on my hand. There are always going to be these unexpected things that are not just these daily stressors that we deal with, but these big things that are going to take a lot of our capacity to be able to deal with. So if we are already scheduling ourselves to all that we can handle. We're not leaving room to deal with that stuff when it happens, because again, we know it is going to happen. It is inevitable. That is life. So making sure that we're taking a look when we're making our schedules, when we are, you know, helping our kids decide what after school activities they want to do, um, what roles we're taking on at our job, um, you know, what committees we're maybe joining, just making sure we're taking a look and we're leaving some room for ourselves to cope. Making sure we're also using shortcuts when we need to. Um, for me, I love cooking. Cooking is like a great stress reliever for me, unless I need to cook to like keep myself alive. <laughs> so if I'm supposed to be like cooking so I can have dinner, it becomes a chore. But if I'm cooking to make like a fancy cake, then I, I will cook that all day. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I do sometimes is I keep frozen meals. Um, so whether that's extras and leftovers that I had from one of the other times that I cooked and I just, you know, put it in Tupperware and stick it in the freezer, or if I go to Wegmans and get a frozen pizza. So that way, when I have days when I'm just like, I do not have the emotional bandwidth to go home and cook right now, I can pull something out of the freezer. And I know it's going to be still like a well-rounded meal. I've still got my veggies, my proteins, my carbs. I've got all this stuff. It's a meal that's still going to make me feel good, but I've kind of used that shortcut. So there's nothing wrong with using shortcuts. We don't need to make everything harder for ourselves all the time. So just keeping those things in mind. Along with that is asking for help when you need it. So, you know, Many of us are, you know, independent and, you know, some of us may live alone, so I don't necessarily have a partner that I can ask to help me out with things, but maybe it's your family. Um, I ha have a terminally ill cat at home that has lived for approximately 10 months longer than we thought she was going to live so far. So there are times when I need some help with her. I need somebody to um, come in and do some of this stuff so that I can sleep a little bit or do whatever. Um, talking to our coworkers or our supervisors saying, hey, listen, it has been a rough week. You know, maybe I need to cut back this week. Maybe I need to, you know, reschedule this meeting to a time when I can emotionally handle things. There is nothing wrong with asking for help. So again, I know these sound like simple things. But sometimes it's, we have to overcome a lot to actually push forward and do, you know, some of this stuff to really look at our schedules and be like, no, I, I'm not going to take on this extra committee work. Uh, no, I am not going to, you know, go to this meeting when this is my scheduled lunchtime and I need my lunch. I need my break during the day. Um, you are entitled to take care of your mental health. How many hours a day does your job pay you for? And how many hours do you actually work during the day? And I'm sure there are some supervisors out there that are like, oh my God, shut this lady up. <laughs> but that counts for supervisors too, right? We do not have to give up our lives for our jobs or for anything. We, taking care of ourselves is part of our life and part of the things that we need to do. 
And like I mentioned, mindfulness practices can help us key in on those early signs of stress so we can intervene early and we can hopefully get or keep from getting to the point where we're so stressed that we can't function. We do these things in a variety of different ways, hobbies. Hobbies are individual. It's whatever you, you like, whatever you enjoy, as long as it's not hurting yourself or hurting somebody else, go for it. Um, the pandemic was a great opportunity for people to try new hobbies or get back into hobbies that they maybe hadn't done in a while. Um, I know I tried learning to play the ukulele. It did not go well. Um, I learned to crochet. That went much better. Um, getting into physical activity. Again, this doesn't mean going to the gym necessarily and like burning 8,000 calories in an hour. It can be just making sure you get up every now and then from your desk and walk around on a nice day. Go and take a walk around outside at work. Um, moving your body in some meaningful way. It doesn't need to be a big calorie burner, just move. Diet doesn't mean any specialized diet. It just means making sure we're getting all the nutrients we need. Um, you know, unless you're on a physician prescribed diet or something along those lines, every body needs carbohydrates, protein, vegetables, fruits, um, fats. We need all of these things to keep our body running um, in an efficient way. Sleep, ah, I cannot stress enough how important sleep is. There is no such thing as catching up on sleep. I don't know who started that rumor <laughs> at some point in time because so many of us are guilty of it saying, you know, like, oh, I might only sleep four or five hours during the week, but on the weekend, I'll catch up and I'll sleep for like 12 hours. Mm -hmm. If we miss sleep, there is no catching up on it. So we need to make sure we're prioritizing sleep. Meditation is great. We're actually going to take a couple of minutes and do a meditation in just a moment um, about self-kindness and self-compassion. So hopefully you will enjoy that. Time management, we've talked about um, engaging with your social group, whoever your people are, making sure that we're not isolating, that we are spending time with people, talking, asking for help, just having fun, just doing something that you enjoy, um, staying away from mind-altering substances. And if you're doing all of these things already, but you're still feeling so stressed to the point where like, I can barely function, I can't do my job, I can't take care of myself or my family, please talk to your doctor. It doesn't need to be a mental health physician or a mental health practitioner. Talk to a primary care physician. Just talk to some sort of medical professional um, because there may be something else going on. There might be a physical health issue. There might be a mental health issue. Um, just please talk to somebody if you're doing all of these things and still experiencing this intense level of stress. So, in talking about things like, um, you know, our locus of control and self-compassion, self-talk, um, it, it all kind of comes down to this concept of radical acceptance. And, you know, I talk about it like it's the easiest thing in the world, but it really isn't. Radical acceptance, self-compassion, uh, really being able to help understand our locus of control. These are things that take work. They take it, this isn't something that we're able to just sit down, do it once, and voila, I have accepted all of the things about life that are difficult. I wish it were that easy. I really do. And when we talk about this, please understand that I'm not saying that this is going to be a quick fix panacea. Uh, radical acceptance is actually a principle of dialectical behavioral therapy um, by Marsha Linehan. Um, and there are some great radical acceptance worksheets out there. Um, I highly recommend looking into it because at this point, with everything that's gone on with the pandemic, I think we're kind of backed into this corner of needing radical acceptance, um, really just understanding on a fundamental level but that there are situations that we, we cannot change. We cannot do anything about them. They are either, again, this external locus of control, we have no control over them, or they're in the past. You know, you can't change something that's already happened at this point. Um, so, you know, it, it really, 
is a challenge to accept these things, but how we do it is taking an honest and mindful look at ourselves. We're looking at the facts, not the judgments that we have about them. Um, we're in looking at the pandemic, just kind of using that as an example, what are the facts of the situations? Not how we feel about the situation. Um, what has brought us to this, to this place? There was a disease, it somehow got out, and then X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D happened afterwards, and that led to where we are here. It's not these stupid people did this or didn't do that. Um, it's not, you know, oh, my, my idiot family or um, anything along those lines. We're, we're taking the judgment out of it. We're taking that subjective look out of it and we're just looking at the facts of whatever the situation is and again through practice we allow ourselves to experience and accept our negative emotions we are entitled to have negative emotions about things we are allowed to think this sucks and i know there's a lot of people who don't want to talk about like oh well this sucks but it does and it's important to accept those and experience those negative emotions rather than push them to the side or push them down. Radical acceptance isn't about changing the experience. It's about looking at how we act and how we react in the face of these negative emotions. We don't have to like the situation. Again, it's about fundamentally accepting it. And again, this is not something that can be done in one little sit down. This is something that can take days, weeks, months, or even years, depending on what's, what the potential situation is for us as an individual. But it's something to really start taking a look at in being able to see, okay, the last two years almost feels like we should have a do-over, but we're not going to get that do-over, right? It, it is what it is at this point. And we can say the phrase, it is what it is, but it doesn't always necessarily mean we believe it. So radical acceptance is something that I really encourage people to look into. Um, and again, potentially work, you know, with a therapist if you have one um, to really kind of be able to accept these negative emotions that we have about this experience. Uh, because the other thing I like to bring up is toxic positivity. It's this, you know, belief that we should only be happy, that we don't want to come into a space with our negative emotions. I'm sure we've all seen like the, you know, little posters, places, you know, good vibes only, you know, we're chill. We don't like to bring people down. We just want to focus on the positive experience. But what we know to be true is that if we don't focus on our negative emotions sometimes, if we don't experience our negative emotions, it actually gives more power to the negative emotions. If we just keep shoving them down and shoving them down, there's going to be a point at which something happens and it's all just going to burst forth and it's going to be not good. Our emotions help us make sense of ourselves and the world around us. They all have a point, they all have a purpose, and they are all valid. So thinking about being sad about leaving a job, it can mean that it was a meaningful experience. Being anxious about a presentation might mean that you care about how you're perceived. That is good information for us to have. Um, it doesn't mean that we sit in those negative emotions for forever. It doesn't mean we wallow in them or let ourselves get swept away by them. But it is important to take note of them, to be able to sit with them for a little while, and then be able to use some of these coping skills, and some of these stress management techniques to be able to move forward, to use that radical acceptance, to be able to say, yeah, this sucks, but there's nothing I can do about it. How do I move forward from this? And again, I'm very sorry that there's not an easier answer. But what we're going to do now uh, with 
just about five or so minutes is we're going to do a quick loving compassion or a loving kindness meditation. So wherever you are in your space, you can go ahead and get comfortable. Um, if you're seated, you know, making sure that your feet are planted firmly on the ground, your arms can be down beside you. Maybe your hands are in your lap or on your desk. Say maybe shift a little bit, make sure that you're comfortable. And then just breathe normally and start observing your breath. Noticing what it feels like it's because it's coming in to your body and as it leaves your body. Notice if your breathing is shallow or if your breathing is deep. We're not trying to change our breathing at this point. We're not doing anything different. We're just noticing. We're also not attaching any judgment. We're not breathing wrong or right. We're just breathing as we are. And as you continue to breathe, I want you to start to think about a situation in your life that's difficult and causing you some stress. It doesn't have to be the most stressful thing, be a small stress event, be a difficult relationship, challenge with work or school. whatever comes to your mind. And take a moment and focus on that event or situation. And as you're thinking about that situation, I want you to start to scan your body. Recognize if you're feeling any stress related to that situation and where you might be feeling that stress. This is different for everyone. Maybe you feel it in your neck, your stomach. Maybe you're noticing your eyes are squeezed shut, your teeth are clenched. Just noticing those spaces where you're feeling this stressful event in your body. And now to yourself, you're going to say, this is a moment of suffering. And as you say this phrase to yourself, just notice how you feel without judgment. You don't need to label the experience as good or bad. At this point, we're just acknowledging the pain or stress that we're experiencing right now.
Now I want you to say to yourself, suffering is a part of life. Remembering unpleasant as it is now, navigating difficult situations are a common experience and it connects us to the rest of humanity. If the phrase suffering as a part of life doesn't connect with you, that's okay. You can also use a phrase like other people feel this way, I am not alone, or we all struggle in our lives. Whichever you connect with most. Now I want you to take your hands and place them one over the other, over your heart. And as you make that contact, I want you to say, may I be kind to myself. And as you say that phrase, Feeling the warmth of your hands on your chest and really tune into those feelings of self-kindness. Each breath. Let that kindness wash over you and wash through you. And if you maybe don't connect with that phrase, you can choose a different one. May I give myself the compassion that I need. May I learn to accept myself as I am. May I forgive myself. May I be strong. When you're ready, lowering your hands back down and gently opening your eyes, coming back to the space. Holding on to that feeling of self-kindness and self-love. And remembering this is an activity you can do in just a few moments. Anytime that you're feeling stressed or you're noticing some of that negative self-talk or like you're not giving yourself enough self-compassion in a moment. So essentially, the bottom line of my presentation today, um, I hope this was uplifting rather than um, too much of a downer for those of you who are joining us today. But the bottom line is essentially, we can only do what we can, right? Um, there's only so much capacity that we have. Um, as much as we may wanna do all the things, um, making sure that we understand to do what we can. And when we can't, be kind to yourself. really and truly accept and understand that there is no perfection. There is no being able to do absolutely everything. And that is okay. Do and find something that brings you joy each day. So whether it's a hobby, spending time with a loved one, just standing out in the sunshine for a little while, whatever it is, do something that brings you joy. And then above all, 
making sure that you rest. So those are the four big takeaways, hopefully, uh, from this presentation today. And with that, my slides are over and I do believe we have a few minutes. So if anyone has any questions, I am happy to try to answer them to the best of my ability. Everyone's still sort of coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I actually um, have more of a, um, I guess, observation or comment. Um, you had talked a little bit about how, you know, setting boundaries with people and not over committing. And um, I sort of had this very interesting experience this past year that um, I, I was, this, this whole thing really did stress me out, <laughs> this whole COVID thing. And I um, it just, it occurred to me, you know, that I didn't, I, I needed to tell people, no, like, do you want to be on this committee? We need for you to do this. And there's always that fear, right? That if you say no, you'll be judged. And I had the experience of showing myself that that was wrong because I did you know, tell people, no, no, I can't be on this search committee or, you know, and I was truthful. I was really stressed out right now. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, and what happened was no one judged me and I still get asked, Hey, can you be on this? It wasn't <laughs> like people started to say, Oh, well, don't ask her. She's just going to say no. Yeah. So I think a lot of times it's challenging our fears too, you know, that, and the first time that you set that boundary, it gets easier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So um, other questions from everyone or, or uh, sharing? <laughs> All right. Well, um, I did want to thank again, Stephanie, for uh, the presentation today. I feel a lot better. Uh, for those of you, for those of you who uh, need to provide some uh, proof of attendance to your institution, you'll notice that there is a uh, something up here now on the screen that you can take a screenshot of, and uh, we'll keep it up there for a couple minutes here. So you know, get your screen grabber, and um, yeah, I think I think we're done. So again, thank you, Stephanie. And, Thank you all for uh, having me. Yeah, and I don't know if um, Wendy wants to add any additional. No, I'm ready for a nap. I'm, I'm nice and relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was wonderful, Stephanie. Thank you so much. I say if you fell asleep, then I did my job. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, Thank you, everyone. And the recording and um, Stephanie, will you share your slides? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Yeah, I no, absolutely. I, I'm happy to send them to you and um, we can send them out. Absolutely. Fantastic. So you'll all get a recording um, link and slides to come. Thank you. Thanks again for having me. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>